Yeah. Yeah. Again, uh, thanks everybody for coming. Uh, we're welcoming Pasty White tonight to the Gene Pool. Uh, just to remind everybody again, uh, this entire stream will be recorded and in its entirety is the property of our guest. So uh, thanks for coming, Pasty. Hey, thanks for having me. It's uh, cool to be here. Absolutely. Um, we'll start out easy on you, get to know you a little better, and uh, work our way to the fun stuff. Um, I ask, ask all the guys this. Uh, what was the first active mushroom you cultivated? So my first uh, active was B positive, like most noobs were, um, from a syringe I got in a head shop locally. And uh, it was a pretty atrocious grow, but like cubes are resilient. And uh, I was able to see enough success to get the bug. A bit, yeah. What, what oh. made you decide to cultivate in the first place? Um, well, I was like, kind of like in a period where I was like getting into Sykes more, um, like I've been with him for quite some time, but, uh, I was, uh, talking to a guy one day, I was like, he was like, dude, I used to get some L from, and, uh, he was like, you should really try growing mushrooms, man. And I was like, oh yeah. And he's like, he's like telling me, he's like, yeah, he's like, it's pretty easy. He's like, I did it once and like had some success and it turned out like he actually grew more mold than mushrooms, but, uh. You know, his assertion that it could be done got me curious, and uh, he gave me the shroomery.org website to go uh, educate myself on it. And so I went and checked the website out and spent a whole pile of time for like the first couple of months lost in the main page. It took me forever to find the forums. <laughs> and then once I did, I like lurked them for so long. So, that's yeah, that's awesome. kind of how I got started. Are there any specific varieties that um, hold a sentimental place to you, other than the obvious, of course? Yeah, so obvious being RW. Um, there's a few, definitely, that I've enjoyed. Um, I think uh, Wickazon was pretty cool. Uh, I grew that quite a bit. Did a lot of bottle grows and stuff back when that was a, a big thing. And I uh, had some pretty some pretty sweet results with it. Um, a pretty classic variety. Another one, uh, costumly super strain KSSS. Uh, I had a print from Will Solven, who I don't know if you if anyone remembers still, but he like was the one that came up with that peyote uh, isolation. And so I had a print from his line. And it, it, it would throw some pretty killer mutants uh, and some pretty killer fruits, actually. Like definitely some dank fruits for sure. You still have it around? You know what? I lost it years ago. It was like, it was so sad. I like gave away like all my prints and I, I just kept going back to the original print and, uh, you know, had great, great success going back to the original print until one day it was like, nope, it all just died. Like I had like tried swiping it over and over again and it was like, no, it's not going to grow enough and tried like pressure hydrating the spores and syringes and stuff like that with elastic bands and whatnot. And it was like, no, it's just not happening. <laughs> rip yep well there's um so many new uh and unstable hybrids floating around right now um any of them that you find particularly interesting or aesthetically pleasing yeah for sure um like i mean obviously some of them i think are just i don't know maybe a, a little bit out there uh, maybe not as stable as people claim or whatever but certainly some of them are like super legit and really impressive um i definitely wouldn't mind trying to like you know grow some of those like albinos or the tats or whatever gandalf looks really cool um i have a feeling like that could be a fun a fun one to play around with so yeah i want to definitely get uh myself uh my next couple of i don't know more exotic style grows will be like some albinos and maybe some pants are you are you into the whole uh, giant fruit thing? You know, I didn't really do a whole lot of it. Like, I mean, when I was like, you know, really pushing hard or whatever for uh, uh, just pushing the envelope in the community, I guess. Um, big fruit wasn't really my goal. I was like looking more for yield. I wanted to like work on stabilizing RW a lot. Uh, I took a huge amount of time. Um, I did have a few pretty hefty size fruits float my way in fact i did get a uh, clone 
that came from the F2 generation of the initial cross that made RW. And it was uh, a pretty interesting uh, lineage right there with a throw out like 100 to 120 gram monsters first flush. And it would just be like a tub full with like 35 fruits that big. But uh, it just didn't have quite the yield. And uh, so I kind of abandoned it. But uh, it was crazy. I, I did a little girl log actually back in the day on it. So, yeah, I guess uh, long story short, I, I, Big Fruits is something I kind of want to like pick up on, have some more fun with. I mean, I grew some Mac, uh, had some big big Fruits from that. I never weighed them because uh, I, I used to like just kind of be like, if it wasn't first flush, I wasn't too interested in like finding the exact weight or whatever. But uh, definitely Big Fruits are fun. Um, I've had some ideas as to how that can be achieved. And uh, I think I'm going to try and pull a couple of interesting grows out here in a little bit, maybe uh, make a couple of uh, posts on my own novelty grows thread, which I haven't actually managed to post anything on in quite some time. <laughs> yeah, you should. and uh, Shoot us a link when you do. Absolutely. I love, uh, love shooting links around. <laughs> so um, I, I was digging around, uh, trying to get a little bit more prepared to talk to Pasty White himself. And uh, I was scrolling through your your old text, uh, that uh, specifically the no pour. And uh, what really surprised me the most was uh, so much of the negativity that immediately followed your post, and especially on what's now known a, a solid tech used by thousands of people all over the world. Um, there were still assholes trying to discredit and flame you, and um, this thing is super common and uh, really toxic in our hobby. Uh, at the time, did it bug you, or uh, did you just shrug it off? I mean, you know, something like that's probably going to bug just about anybody to some degree. I mean, I'd probably be lying if I like tried to make like, oh, it didn't bug me whatsoever. But at the same time, that was a big part of what the OMC was like back then. I mean, you know, you could get like taken down a peg by anybody for whatever reason. Like, I mean, uh, it used to be a lot. Uh, a lot less forgiving, believe it or not. Um, a lot of people now like think like things are really toxic and bad, and in some in some places they are, to be honest. But uh, it, it was never an easy uh, community to break into, right? So you had to be proving yourself at like every turn. Um, when it came to like that, like particular instance. I don't know. I, I guess like I was like momentarily annoyed, but at the same time it was like, meh, you know, there's enough people here that like also are enjoying it or whatever. So I'm just going to try to focus on the positives. And uh, that's kind of been like my, my whole thing, like with, uh, with cultivation in general, I just, I just want to do like, you know, some fun stuff and, uh, you know, discover what I can and carry around. Right. That's awesome. We're just here to grow some mushrooms, have a little fun. Exactly, right? Like, you know, that's what it's all about in the end, right? Uh, I think sometimes we forget that, right? Like, you know, people get, like, so obsessed with, like, the holy grails or whatever that they forget that, you know, at the end of the day, <laughs> this is, like, a pretty cool hobby, you know, and this is a pretty neat thing that we can see unfold in front of ourselves. Like, I always get pretty stoked when I see mushrooms growing. <laughs> well, you're, um, contributions to the craft are pretty innumerable uh you've been posted on shroomery for over a decade now right oh yeah, from, uh, yeah. Your, from uh your agar to the easy dial uh the unmodified lid is a fucking godsend um i don't punch holes in any lids man uh did you ever think your posts on some obscure message board uh, would someday be synonymous with home mushroom cultivation uh, that's pretty generous. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure if I would go that far to say that they're synonymous, but uh, I guess I've enjoyed a fair amount of like, I don't know, exposure, I guess, and managed to make some pretty good contributions. And if that's gotten me a bit of a reputation or whatever, then I'll wear it, I suppose. Um, you know, I always just kind of wanted to give back to the hobby that gave a lot to me, or at least I felt gave a lot to me. And, uh, you know, I, I guess, like, maybe I could, like, rest on my laurels if I wanted to. Um, but I, I still want to have fun. There's still stuff I want to do. And, uh, you know, if I could help, like, 
develop understanding or, you know, help people out with anything, I would be, you know, pretty happy to do so. I, you know, I've, I still try to answer questions to people like, you know, how do you miss cakes or, you know, what's, what's the basics of a model tub, right? So I don't want to lose that completely. It's, it's uh, fulfilling, right? Absolutely. And um, I, I've asked um, all the guests we've had on here, uh, the general consensus here, um, uh, everyone's followed at least one of your texts, and uh, you're an inspiration to a lot of folks. Uh, when you first started to grow, uh, who were your inspirations, and uh, whose texts were you following? Oh, this is uh, some good stuff, some blast from the past. So um, there's been a few uh, a few notable ones in my mind, and uh, no one more important, I'd say, than Heltic. Um, actually a pretty obscure character, but he came up with uh, a precursor to my agar tech. He was using jars and like he was making like inoculation ports in the lids and stuff like that, which I saw as rather superfluous. But uh, when uh, when I read that no part agar tech, I was like, oh man, I was like, I can do this. This is easy, and uh, it kind of got me got me rolling on my no pour, on my first no pour agar. So I mean. Uh, without that, I, it was kind of funny. I was struggling with a lot of contams. I, I couldn't find a good syringe. I, I bought syringes from Spores 101 and from Ralphsters, and they were all contaminated. Uh, I thought, oh, my God, how do people ever manage to ever get anything? Like, did I just fluke out in, like, my first, like, you know, couple of grows and, like, get super lucky with a clean syringe? And, uh, yeah, I became convinced that I needed agar to, like, save my ability to grow. So I was like desperate and i was like super intimidated by poor agar and so when i found that hell tic tac it was like yes that's that's going to be my go-to um there's a few others uh spongy form had a pf cake tech that he did in the glad mini rounds that i like uh use for my uh easy agar so it was kind of a light bulb moment for me when i saw that tech because i was like oh my god you can pressure cook these things and uh, as soon as I realized that, it was like, okay, I can get away from using glass. I didn't like glass. I found it to be heavy and slippery and uh, just uh, wanted something that was a little bit uh, little bit more ergonomic, I guess, or a little bit lighter. And, uh, yeah, went from there. It was, it was really awesome. Uh, a few other ma major texts uh, that I, like, looked at was the Roger Rabbit um, Let's Grow Mushroom series. I had the original DVD and... Uh, it was actually pretty cool. Like, it's got a lot of neat stuff on it when you have the actual DVD, uh, a few extra things that aren't available online. And, uh, yeah, it was it was a pretty important way for me to learn agar, um, you know, how to make the transfers, how to make the movements. Um, so, you know, he was kind of like the, the guy that schooled everybody, right, if you get right down to it. I mean, um, some of the other... Uh, Big inspirations for me, I guess, were like Workman. Um, I mean, like, you know, reading how he made APE was like a huge part of what inspired me to like come up with Rusty White. Um, and seeing how Workman did it made me realize that you didn't need to have snake venom. And it removed a lot of the, uh, the mystique surrounding, um, you know, basic methods of crossing cubensis. And, uh, when I saw that, I, I knew that I could do it myself. So, um, you know, big props to Workman. Captain Future, he was, like, always, like, super amazing. Like, he dropped, like, the craziest girl logs. They were so cool to follow. Um, who else? Uh, there's a, there's just so many, like, amazing growers. Like, um, I used to, like, just be blown away. Frank Horrigan, I mean, that guy, he, he really stepped the bar up a lot with, like, quality of tax and stuff. Um, Team Ethel, he was amazing. Uh, I was like really close personal friends in real life with uh, Van de Gregen. Uh, you know, that guy was like one of the most uh, scientifically minded people I've ever met and uh, an absolute genius. He had just so many people that uh, have been a monstrous influence on me over the years. Like, I couldn't possibly name them all. I'm sure I'd, I feel like I've left some out. I uh, learned so much from like the people that were. Um, in the kind of journal clubs and stuff like that that we were having happen around 2014, 2015. Um, learned so much from those people. Like, you know, even Bodhi, like, I mean, 
he talks about learning from like me and Kron or whatever, but we learned lots from him too. It was like everybody just kind of learned from everybody. And uh, that was a super cool part of the, the culture back then. We'd like to think it's still kind of going on now. You know, it really is. It's it's actually like, yeah, to like totally not to take away, it is going on now. Like there are some amazing crosses being made, like species being crossed. Like, I mean, it's, it's just unbelievable. Like I, I had to like take a little bit of a, a break from everything for a bit for a couple of, a couple of years ago. And uh, when I came back, it was just like, wow, there's like so much cool stuff happening. Like I was just like, you know, almost like a noob myself, like jumping back in, like, look at all this going on. It seems so cool. So, yeah, I mean, all these like uh, variety crosses and like, uh, you know, like the stuff that like Jake on Sid did and Keylor did, and, like, yeah, just so many wicked exotics. You know, Zap at the Quorums now are getting stabilized. Like, holy crap. Like, I mean, it's just, it's a cool and exciting time. Like, so much has happened. And Jick and them Tat Syndicate boys, man. Uh, they've been busy, for sure. They have, and there's a lot of really... I mean, I remember a time when we were afraid that there would never be another albino other than APE. You know, like, people are, like, literally despondent about that. Or the fact that, like, there was, like, you know, Homestead and, like, the revival of that. Like, you know, that's been huge, too. Like, you know, like... I remember a time when, like, we were like, how do we save the Sporeworks line? Because it's just shit, you know? <laughs> So, uh, yeah, there's just been some, like, a really cool, amazing things happening with genetics and techniques and, yeah, exciting. Oh, yeah. Um, so, um, everyone on the internet is always sharing uh, their success stories and their pictures of uh, exploding canopies, um, but not very often do you see anyone sharing their failures. And uh, I think letting others know that uh, failure in this hobby is absolutely inevitable. Uh, we all fail. Uh, we fail miserably. And I think it's pretty important because the time invested prior to these disasters really hurts. And it's it's pretty disheartening. Uh, if, if someone tells you they've never had a visit from Tammy, uh, they're full of shit. Um, can you remember any specific uh, disappointing failures you'd like to share? Like, tell us that Pasty fails, too. Oh, there, there actually are some uh, some pretty epic ones. And, uh, you know, some of them are like a little bit easier to laugh, uh, laugh at when you look back on them. And other ones, they still stick a little close to home. Um, I think some of the, the ones that are easier to laugh at are things that I just did just, just because, like, I, I, why can't I do this, you know? So um, I remember, like, wanting to make like, a really big bulk cake like i wanted to make like a huge substrate like super thick it was going to be gigantic and so i like literally filled the five gallon pail up with like core verm and spawn <laughs> and uh, you know lucy put the lid on and thought this is going to be great i'll be able to grow huge mushrooms out of this but uh it went completely anaerobic like i mean the smell that came out of this thing was just hideous two days and the amount of heat that was generated by the colony that was so massive literally killed itself. Killed itself with its own bio heat. <laughs> so that that was a pretty good one. Um, another one that's a little less easy to laugh about. Uh, it must have been the grain somehow. But I just, I literally was like 30-40% failure rate, maybe even more. The only way that I could even get a decent first flush was if I used LC. And uh, I don't know. I still have nightmares about that grain. I stopped using it, and, and the second I stopped using it, went right back to a hundred percent success rate. So I don't know. That that's one of the the ones that plagues you. Like, what was really going on there? Um, <laughs> I may never know. But uh, yeah, th those are a couple of a couple of ones. Uh, a few other pretty uh, amazingly cheese ball moments that. I had were uh, some of my first grows. I mean, like, my God, we didn't know anything, and I knew even less. Um, I was, like, doing PF tech, and I was, like, using, like, pint jars for it, and, you know, it was just a disaster from beginning to end. I still made it all work somehow, 
But uh, once I started to get contaminated syringes and stuff, those were just absolutely crushing moments too. Growing my first oysters instead of the, I don't know, I think it was like Cambodians or something that I was supposed to be growing. <laughs> that, that was pretty crushing, right? Like you see that and it's like, oh my God. <laughs> Well, you've obviously had uh, your fair share of success as well. Um, any particular grows you remember fondly, like a tub that made you do the happy dance when you saw it pin? Yeah, there was there was a bunch of those, actually. like A um, couple of really notable ones, I guess. One of the first ones that I, I really was super happy about was my first uh, Ganoderma lucidium grow. Uh I'd never grown Rishi before, and uh, I was super excited about it, and it just turned out amazing. Like, it was just such a fun grow. I was doing a grow log on it, did them in monotubs, and uh, they turned out amazing. And I was, I just loved it. It was, like, basically, like, you know, six weeks of, like, this is so much fun. Every day I come in, track the, track the progress, and it was a blast. Um, another really amazing one, obviously, was my uh, my bathtub. Like the guy that grow, and uh, uh, when I found the first rusty white pin that was like leucistic with brown spores, when I found that in the agar plate, it was like at the real moments. Like I've been looking for so long. Um, I, I had through so many cultures, and uh, it was all bust. Like either like one or the other, but never both. And uh, yeah, when I saw that pin, it was just like. I couldn't believe it. And I was about to toss it too. Like the plate was about to get pitched in the trash. You know? And then I was like, wait a sec, there's a pin in there. And the spores are brown and the pin looks white. So, yeah, it was a pretty, pretty huge moment for me when I like took that clone and then fruited that, like waiting for that clone to, you know, colonize and pin. That was a, that was a long wait. Like definitely felt that. That's awesome, man. Do you mean, uh, did you almost pitch Rusty White then? Dude, I almost did. It was like freaking close. <laughs> that's crazy. It really is. Like like to me, that's like the quintessential, like, you know, like accident that you didn't see coming, right? Like people like try to make those things happen, but they don't they really don't happen just when you try to force them. Like it's just like when you manage to have enough knowledge built up that you can at least see the opportunity for what it is. Like, that's totally what, I mean, Jick's kind of situation. He didn't really see what was going on, but other people did, and he just took their word for it and ran with it. And next thing you know, you have TAT, right? So, Right, and uh, speaking of Jick, he's a big fan. I was actually chatting with him earlier today, and I said, you know what, I'll tell Pacey you send some love. And he said, oh, don't worry, he knows. Oh, I do, but I do. You, you, you guys must be good friends. Oh, yeah, we talk all the time. I'm a big fan of those guys. I love the syndicate. No, Jake's totally real. I like that guy. He's awesome. So our, uh, our home fungi farmer movement, right? Uh, this bubble just keeps getting bigger, man. Uh, the Internet's overflowing now with information, tools, spores, uh, ready-to-go materials from agar to grain, substrate, inflatable monotubs. Uh, our hobby is going super mainstream. Uh, what do you envision the future of a uh, home mushroom cultivation is going to be like? Well, that one's like a hard thing to say because I mean, you know, the, there has been a fairly good uh, progression already over like the last, I don't know, 30 years or however long it's been realistically relevant. Um, and so, you know, we kind of like have reached a lot of idealized situations on one hand, but we're just scratching the surface on the other thing on the other. Um, obviously, with the massive influx of people, individuals, there's, there's going to be a, a more diversity of skill sets coming in and, and people who have the ability to kind of execute at certain levels. Um, you know, you see those inflatable monotubs. Those are obviously, you know, appealing to certain individuals. Uh, and when I saw it, I was actually like, you know, I couldn't hate on it too much, to be honest. Like, I mean, the price is, is ridiculous, um, but the concept itself isn't the worst thing. I mean, you know, uh, could that be made to to work decently? Yeah, good. You know, absolutely. So, um, 
do I see more of that kind of stuff starting to be creeping up? Absolutely, for sure. People are going to want to start doing that. But I think there's also going to be a lot more of a, a kind of a gray area happening that we're going to start seeing a renaissance of as well, um, you know, for people that want access but don't necessarily want to, you know, pick up a new hobby. So it's going to be kind of like a, a double-edged sword. You're going to have, like, a big influx of all kinds of stuff. And to, like, you know, talk it all down or whatever – it might not even be feasible um, and, and not everybody's going to want that. But uh, I do think that the, uh, the amount of access that there is to things now, um, the amount of like sheer uh, literature, the, the amount of links that you can read on how to do stuff. I mean, it's just, I mean, I wish that there was like, you know, the, the buds easy as F fucking series when I was like learning, that would have been pretty handy. You know? <laughs> Yeah, no lies. Uh, you and Bod kind of made it pretty easy for a lot of us. So yeah, I mean, I'm I'm glad I was able to because, God, some of the stuff that I went through kind of sucked. And uh, you know, um, if I could be like you know of of uh, a, a net positive in any small way, that's that's wicked to me. I'm happy to do it. Just a small way, though. You don't have to be so humble, man. <laughs> I suppose. <laughs> Do you think uh, this home cultivation uh, renaissance is going to lead to any kind of future legislation to decriminalize or uh, maybe even the opposite? Like the ether and the opposite there. Um, it's like a kind of like a hard thing to kind of just come out and like say yay or nay, right? Um, Obviously, it's going to carry some kind of a influence, no matter what. Um, I think that uh, you know, as it becomes more normalized and people are able to access more through various means, or whatever, um, the governments are going to have no choice but to kind of recognize that. I think, um, especially given the recent medicinal uh, legitimacy here in Canada. Uh, the Supreme Court has actually ruled in favor of people to be able to access their own medicine. And uh, the government is like kind of like looking bad right now uh, to a lot of people, you know, the, the way that they have dragged their heels on these, these subjects. Because at the end of the day, you know, as much fun as a lot of this stuff is, this is also a medicine for a lot of people, including myself. Um, it's a big part of why I, I use it is to control cluster headaches. And, uh, you know, it's just, it's a huge benefits, um, to a lot of different people for a lot of different reasons. So I think that, uh, people should be allowed to, you know, access their own medicine and people should be allowed to put what they want in their own bodies. So, uh, you know, mushrooms are pretty, uh, low on the totem pole when it comes to causing social strain. So I think that, uh, in light of that, you know, there's going to be a, a real lack of willingness by the state to let's say enforce their current psychedelic laws including the ones surrounding the cultivation of mushrooms absolutely we could only hope man and that's, that's my hope that, that is my hope i mean maybe it might not happen but i feel uh -huh. i feel it's going to i feel like like you know cannabis has already paved the way uh in part and uh, we just have to like kind of learn from the things that went wrong there and do it better with mushrooms. And I think mushrooms have huge potential. Like just, it's just so, so untapped. They're, they're just scratching the surface. So um, let's talk about your rusty white. I've been putting it off. I know everybody wants to hear about it. Um, for anyone that doesn't know, can you just give us the whole lowdown from the beginning? Yeah, so I guess, like, to go right back to the beginning, um, there's, like, people, like, that were, like, you know, talking about crossing, and, like, we didn't really have a super great grasp of the nomenclature, but, uh, you know, Buller's phenomenon was generally understood to be a thing, and uh, most of the people that I was talking with at the time were kind of, like, of the mind that, like, you know, the snake venom was just a smoke screen. We didn't need to worry about that for, for cubensis, you know, for, for just a simple cross within the species. And so because of that, a lot of us did think, Hey, we should start crossing stuff. And, uh, 
one of the ones that I wanted to do was uh, Albino A plus crossed with Columbian Rustbore. And uh, I knew that Kron wanted to try to do it too. And he actually had crossed it himself, actually, but he never took it anywhere. And there were some other people that actually crossed it as well. Um, but I wanted to be the first one to get it really stabilized. And uh, it was uh, it was quite an interesting journey. Like basically, I, I took two. I took a swab. I actually, did back it right up. I, I did two coincidental grows, uh, CRS and AA plus, and uh, just uh, got it through time, correlating at the exact same time. And so I was able to make a swab on the same day with each fruit. I put like one half of the swab was uh, AA, and the other half of the swab was CRS. And then when I inoculated the plates, I just spun the swabs into the plate. And uh, just a big, monstrous mash of spores. Took some real generous transfers. I think I only went to T2 and then threw it on grain. And it, it came out like the fruits are kind of like this homogenized, actually, like caramel color. Like the stipes were almost the same shade as the caps. And they, they weren't pure white, but they were kind of, they weren't dark either. It was like halfway. And uh, Workman came in and was like, yep, looks like you, ma you made it. That's what I expected it to look like. I was like, sweet. And so then I had the task of trying to find the F2 expression that I wanted. And the F2 was all over the map. Like I was getting stuff that had like leucistics. Like you take one tiny little wedge and from that you'd have like, you know, a pile of leucistic fruits, a pile of like regular fruits with purple spores, and a pile of regular looking fruits with brown spores. But never, never any of the the the, the ones that you wanted one of each. So it, it was really tough. Uh, I was doing like first I started off doing mini monos, and I ran like a couple of dozen different mini monos, all from MS. And then uh, none of those were really working out really the way I wanted. I saw like all kinds of crazy, some, some actually really good grows, but uh, nothing that was a, that I really wanted. Um, I did have that big pin clone that I talked about where like, it was like 120 gram fruits, first flush. That one did show up in that, uh, that F2 search, but uh, I, I wasn't interested in that one really. I wanted my white fruit with the brown spores. And so, yeah, then basically I started uh, doing uh, in vitro straws, straw jars. I don't know if people remember my in vitro straw tech, but I used to do a version of it where I would only fill a Ziploc container, like one of the one liter Ziploc containers. I would just fill like the bottom third of it up with the straw mix. And then I would just let it pin in fruit in vitro. And uh, I could get really clean samples doing that. And you could like expand lots. So, like, just basically an agar wedge or two to each one, and you just shake the agar wedge around and get inoculating all the all the disc at the bottom, and just tears through it really fast. So I, I did probably I don't know thirty or forty of those, all to no avail. And then one day I found my my in vitro pin, and uh, it had the brown spores and it had the white fruit, and I was super stoked. I took a clone, and the clone uh, turned out to produced the fruits that I wanted. I was a little bit disappointed initially on the yield until I realized maybe I need to actually give it a top layer and change some of the conditions a bit. And so uh, I started to use a lower spawn ratio because in those days, everybody was using super high spawn ratios. People were doing like one to one or even greater. And uh, I was like, you know, what? I'm going to get this spawn ratio down to like one to three. And so I pushed the spawn ratio down and uh, gave it a top layer even though the consensus was, oh, they don't need top layers, screw that shit. But I was like, you know, let me give it a top layer, see if it likes it. And then, boom, it was like crazy canopy, crazy yields, amazing uh, fruit color, spores of the right color. It was, it was everything I wanted, the whole package, wicked potency. And I was like, okay, this is, this is how this wants to be fruited. And uh, from there I went on, like took spore prints from that one, that clone and, just moved her forward every time. Like I would, I would take the clone, test it, try the potency, see what the yields were like. If things were kind of lining up, then I would go with it. And I was like running like a few multiples, like fourth generation, for instance. I think I ran five clones against each other and picked the best one. Like I did work, you know, a fair bit to try to find something that was going to, you know, be a net asset to each generation. So 
And then, uh, yeah, after uh, after seven gens, I uh, released it. There's people champing at the bit. Like, I couldn't wait any longer. So, I mean, I know oh, there was some instant... That's one of my most favorite threads on Shroomery was your whole <laughs> rusty white grow along, man. It was it's exciting to read even years and years later. Yeah, I was I'm I'm really happy the way that that thread's turned out. I mean, when I made it, I was like, you know, hopeful that it would like become like, you know, a little piece of living history maybe or like people could like come back and have a look at how stuff was done back then or whatever. Um and the fact that it has, I'm super happy about that. Like, it's probably a good one of my best accomplishments. So, I guess I can keep my heart a little bit about it. I guess. <laughs> so, do you have any uh, uh, crazy ideas for Rusty White in the future, like uh, chasing a squat or a coral mutation, uh, maybe even like a tat syndicate cross? Well, um, that's actually. I had looked at crossing it with uh, PE already once, and uh, it didn't really go anywhere um, great, so I kind of abandoned it. But uh, I've totally had the idea that I want to like uh, still do further crosses with RW, and uh, I'm not quite done um, with that whole thing yet. Like I've gotten it to the 10th generation now, and I'm about to see what that's going to be like. And so once I do... Um, I might do some uh, playing around with some with some things, uh, you know, back crossing or another cross or something. Um, I definitely would like to play with some TAT. I don't know if I want to mess around with crossing RW with an albino, though, simply because um, if you bring the albino pigment into the you don't want to lose those spores. you lose you lose the spores, right? And so, right. you know, uh, to me, it's kind of like a little bit of a non sequitur, right? I would, uh, I think, I'm gonna. I want to try to like get in some TAT and like play with some of those albinos uh, genetics. Um, but if I was going to play with them, I might try some other stuff. Um, have some uh, some other ideas for for stuff like that. So I do have some wild stuff I've been playing with, and uh, there might be something interesting there too. So you never know. Uh, I might be coming out with uh, a couple of posts here in the near future about uh, something Actually, new on uh, front. I had a dear friend, uh, Solipsis. I don't know if you know him. Uh, he kind of went dark, but uh, he had a coral mutant of your rusty white going around, and uh, oh, really? I can't make I can't make it do anything. I actually my rusty white is abysmal. Uh, the best I've been able to do was an in vitro jar grow, but uh, all all I've been running is a uh, culture my friend gave me. Um, but I got my in vitro to go, so I'm going to run it from the print, and uh, I'll make you proud, Pacey, I promise. Uh, that's awesome, man. I appreciate <laughs> that. Uh, once, I, once I get some of my grow situation figured out, because it's kind of a little bit chaotic for me in IRL right now, um, uh, I'll look at like, maybe getting some more prints together for some, for some people or whatever. Um, definitely want to try to like spread a little bit more spores like I used to. Uh, back in the day, I used to be involved in the print lottos and things of that nature and uh it's rewarding stuff right so wouldn't mind getting back in some of that absolutely and um it sounds like uh we're going to be doing a, a gandalf grow along uh, here at the gene pool and uh you're Ooh. more than welcome to get down on it with us oh i might take you up on that <laughs> right <laughs> that's my rubber arm there <laughs> Well, dude, I really appreciate you coming, man. Uh, it's really crazy to sit here and get to chat with our heroes. So uh, I don't want to hog all the time, man. Um, uh, thank you again, dude, for all you've contributed, all the positivity and the push you put into this hobby. So uh, I'm going to take my leave and uh, let these guys jump in, ask some questions. Again, uh, thank you, brother, and uh, much love to you. Uh, thank you. Uh, this has been a great time. Appreciate the opportunity.